Thank you. We've approached this with only one rule as guidance, which is there's to be no preparation and no work involved. <laughs> We're going to ask each other the stickiest of questions we can think of, the questions that probably neither of us want to have to answer. So, first up, Barry, my question I for you... I had some very kind questions for you. Now I'm, I hear that they're only sticky questions. Well... I need more time to think. How, how does it feel that your wife, Heather you at the program Backroads, is now well and truly outrating any numbers you ever got for Insiders? <laughs> well, give us the time slot. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, it's fantastic. Um, that, um, I'm, I'm thrilled with the way the Backroads has gone, obviously. You know, in the time that we... You, you talked about <laughs> unrehearsed... Well, this is the program is totally without... Well, we haven't rehearsed it. I, from the moment that um, Insiders started, so 18 years ago, I was um, did politics with John on a Thursday morning, so we did it for 18 years. And not once, I think, did we ever have a phone call, exchange of emails, text messages about the issues or how we would approach it. Nothing about that was ever cooked up. I would just go into the studio, I'd have no idea where John would go. I can anticipate it, of course, and I was hoping that, he would, that he'd be on topic, and mostly he was. Um, but, but I think it worked um, largely because we, we just didn't put our heads together and didn't figure it all out in advance and just saw where the conversation went. And it was a... Well, it's a great amount of trust that I place in you, and I know that you're going to be across it because people... You see Barry on TV on Sunday morning, what you don't know is that he's pretty much on duty and on, you know, on song seven days a week, as many hours as he's awake, he's just constantly keeping mm. across it all. So what's it like letting go? And, and that is a bit of an issue for me because, I mean, I'm not giving away trade secrets here, but one thing that I'm sort of discussing with the ABC is maybe next year being a, um, an analyst across the platforms in, in some form or another. And I really do have to think about that because that gets me back to right where, what I left. And that is that from Monday morning, 7 o'clock, all the way through the week, you've got to be across everything. And you, never, you can never walk away from it. And you can never just go away for a couple of weeks and put it behind you. You just have to... You get caught out. It's, it's, it's too easy to get trapped these days. It's, it's such a moving feast. So, I mean, that, that's, that's a bit of an issue for me. But I, I've, it, it makes it harder now because I have walked away from it for about eight weeks or something now. And, boy, it was easy. <laughs> <laughs> What do you miss? Hmm? What do you miss now after eight weeks? So far, nothing. <laughs> um, when I was away for overseas for about five weeks of it and I came back and I just felt that, that the nature of the political debate had got worse, if anything. Like, that it just seemed to me, and look, don't hold me to this because, as I said, I haven't been following it all that closely, but I just get the feeling that almost everything that the government's doing right now in terms of uh, policy discussion and in the formulation of legislation is designed to wedge the opposition. It's, it's not there to, um, um, to introduce good public policy um, at a reasonable rate and, and over time. It's rushed and it's there. And the media has signed up to that because what I noticed when I got back was there was so much attention on how the Labor Party is responding to government policy rather than a discussion about the government policy. If indeed you do have the answer to this question, I doubt you're going to share it with 350 people in the studio right now because you'd probably instead go off and uh, charge $50,000 an hour for a consultancy. But what on earth has gone wrong? We've got Boris Johnson, Donald Trump, we've got the rise of populism, we've got Duterte in the Philippines, we've got the collapse of so much civil debate and discourse, we've got the rise of populists throughout half the so-called democratic world, hmm. and we're sitting there going, what happened? Any yeah. idea? It wasn't sudden. Um, it, it started in Europe some time ago, the rise of the, of the right, but um, the, the Donald Trump victory was the staggering one. And it's just, as every day goes by, it's just more bewildering that how can somebody as, as vile and as obnoxious as Donald Trump um, not only be president of the United States but has an even money chance of staying president beyond the next election? And it's almost as if America now regards their country as an economy and that's it. It's not a community and it doesn't matter that their leader... Uh, can behave in the way that he does. It doesn't matter that he sends all the wrong signals to the next generation of Americans, that he's whipping up, um, that he's whipping up these hate groups. No, he's not doing it um, directly, but they feel empowered by some of the language that he uses. When he says, for example, that uh, 
that uh, Mexicans are, um, are, are, are criminals and they're coming across the border and they're rapists and they're invaders. And then he seems surprised that some maniac takes a, takes a semi-automatic gun and, uh, or assault weapon and, 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 and deliberately kills Mexicans. It's, you know, so how is this happening? You know, what, what is happening to society you know, in America when the, her leader is not there just to formulate policy and run an economy? Her leader is there um, to be the cultural and the, and, the, and the moral leader of a country, and it's not happening. Boris Johnson, I don't think you could put in the same category. I think he'll just be a bit of a buffoon and, and maybe a, an entertaining one at times. Um, in Australia, I think, where they lost the plot in terms of um, who controlled the country was when the NEG, the National Energy Guarantee Scheme, came up for a vote and Malcolm Turnbull hesitated and then walked away from it. What that did, <clears throat> because what he feared is that about 10 of his own, the, the far right, led by Tony Abbott and others, would vote, of, uh, vote against it across the floor in the parliament and they just couldn't allow that spectacle to happen. So you get a situation where... Maybe 140 of the 150 members of parliament would have supported the NEG. Business leaders wanted it, industry groups wanted it, and they balked, and they balked because of that. They didn't want that. So what happens? That gave that fringe group on the right the knowledge, the absolute knowledge that they now call the shots, that when you can hold that threat over your party and know that you're going to get that result, they now run the country. And they do. And as a result, you saw all of these moderates leave at the, at the last elections. Some of the best people in the parliament over the last 20 years have gone uh, because they're moderates and they just couldn't, um, couldn't stomach what had happened. But over the sweep of your working life, from being in the press gallery through to working as a press secretary and then back being a commentator, you've seen different fads and fashions, political fads and fashions mm -hmm. come and go. Is this just another one? Is it just another short-term little blip on the historical horizon or is it something bigger? Uh, well, it, it, it'll last for as long as the current players are there and it would take um, either a change of leadership or an election defeat or something to, to shake that out. But it, what really, I think, changed um, politics for the worst was when Kevin Rudd was first elected and he decided uh, that every day was a separate election campaign that had to be won every day... And so he introduced these doorstops daily and, and chose an issue and went out and fought it. And if you do that, if you think every day is an election campaign to be won, then where's the planning? Where's the real policy development? Um, where, where's the sort of three, even the three-year um, three vision? Um, so I think uh, that changed. And every leader since has adopted the same strategy until now. And now um, uh, Morrison is saying that he's, he's not doing that. Um, that he's going to take a step back. Um, and I hope he's sincere about this, but what we have to be aware of, I think, or at least be, um, keep a sceptical mind over this, is that this may be an excuse on his part just to avoid accountability and scrutiny. Um, if he replaces those insane daily doorstops in their, you know, leather, in their vests and so on with weekly news conferences, more regular appearances in the media, fine, then the accountability's there. But if he just walks away from it, then, then of course, it's a bad thing. Uh, I want to take you back to the start, if I can, John, because um, it just seems to me like you, you, um, um, you studied law, um, and it just seemed to me that um, not all lawyers are good lawyers, but the thing about lawyers is they make very good comedians. Have you noticed that? <laughs> And they make very good broadcasters. I mean, even in this town, we have Ross Stevenson and John Fain. Um, what was it that got you over the line? Why was it media rather than the law? I worked... Uh, I was a practitioner for seven years, so I gave it a fair shake. I did four years of commercial litigation, and there's probably people here who are groaning inside at the mere mention of it, but um, that means you're fighting over other people's money, and at sort of one stage... Um, I mean, literally that kind of light bulb moment, um, I was sitting in the office, I was doing a lot of um, heavy lifting kind of, you know, arguments about money. And the commissionaire, do you remember commissionaires? They were usually returned soldiers from World War II who would go around town delivering documents and things. And the commissionaire came in with a trolley and a tea chest and in the tea chest was a pile, a tea chest full of documents and a whole lot of plans and architect's drawings poking out of the top of the tea chest. And he said, these are for you. And I had a look at them and they were the documents for a case that I had to run, acting for an engineer who was being sued along with nine other parties over a leaking aircraft hangar at the airport. 
and I looked at this tea chest full of documents and I thought, I'm acting for an engineer who's got professional insurance. I'm really acting for an insurance company. We're going to contribute somewhere between 8 and 12% to the cost of rectification of an aircraft hangar. Everyone knows that. It's going to come down to what's in that tea chest and I'm going to have to spend about a week just sitting here reading the tea chest full of documents to save an insurance company a couple of percent on rectification of an aircraft hangar that's leaking. And quite frankly, I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> but at the same time, I was volunteering at night at the, um, at the Tenants' Union Legal Service and at Fitzroy Legal Service. And I suddenly realised that when I was volunteering at night at the Free Legal Centre, I was much happier and much more switched on. And so a job came up to kind of abbreviate it. A job came up and I left. I resigned and I went to work full-time at Fitzroy Legal Service. While I was there, I started doing media because part of your job at the legal service is to be an agitator, to be an activist, to be an advocate for reform, not just to sort of work the system but to improve the system. And so I started being called. In fact, I became a bit of a media tart. Uh, when people needed a dial-a-quote lawyer, they'd ring up Fitzroy Legal Service and I'd mm. pop up and I started doing some work for... Well, I'd started appearing on the ABC and I thought, this is cool. And I met a man called Tom Malombi, who some of you may remember, who was the producer and presenter, the, the, the host of The Law Report on Radio National. And we did quite a few things together, including some very funny ones, including a great hoax, that, a story I'll tell one day. And he told me one day that he was leaving. He was going to the bar and he's since gone on to be a very successful QC in Sydney. And he said, I'm leaving... And there's only three or four people I know who could do my job and you're one of them. If you want to have a crack at it, you should. And I was running out of puff at the legal service. I was sort of accepting that after three years of working seven days a week, 15 hours a day, I couldn't keep doing it much longer. So I had a crack at it and I got the job and I came to the ABC in 1989 as the Law Report producer-presenter. Mm. Well, that background in, in law has served you well as a broadcaster, obviously, but in this town in particular, I mean, there's, police control is, is constantly a story... But you must leave frustrated with where it is right at the moment. I mean, it came through with that interview uh, with Graham Ashton, but... Yeah, um, Graham Ashton was... Uh, I mean, look, he's, he's a, obviously, as the police commissioner, he's a decent bloke. He's got a bit of a shit sandwich and he's doing the best that he can with it. The Royal Commission is going to do what the Royal Commission's got to do, but it's my job, regardless of what I might personally think of Graham, it's my job to, uh, you know, ask the questions that the community want asked, no matter what I think, and... Uh, that's one of the most difficult and complex interviews I've ever had to prepare for. So it was probably 10 hours of prep in that one 25-minute interview. Uh, you've got to read all the documents. You've got to make sure you know what you're talking about. If you make a mistake, then you destroy your own credibility in asking the question. You kind of disarm yourself. So, yeah, you've got to do that. You've got to take on those. Um, yeah, the situation at the moment with the Royal Commission... It's almost like we need a Royal Commission into the Royal Commission mm. and what's going wrong with it. And you get once in a generation, you get these opportunities to clean out a police force, whether it's Fitzgerald and Queensland or what's gone in New South Wales or Western Australia for that matter. And uh, if we don't do this one properly, then we're still going to have the same problems. This is one of the most extraordinary stories that has emerged yep. in your time, surely, the Absolutely. whole Lawyer X thing. I think it's the most extraordinary story in the history of policing in Australia, actually, mm. and of the legal profession. It, it's beyond the contemplation of anybody steeped in the culture of the law that you could be a, uh, not just successful, but even very highly regarded barrister and then engage in a fraction of what Nicola Gobbo is now being revealed as having engaged in. Uh, you know, the ethical bypass here is beyond what anyone could contemplate and the failures, not just by the police to say, hang on, we shouldn't be doing this, but also at other levels are, uh, I think, still to be fully explored. And there's mm. a fair bit of legal scuttlebutt behind the scenes and Now's not the time or the place to air some of that, but I, I hope, sincerely hope, that it all gets a thorough venting and a thorough cleansing. You, um, you talked about how you put 10 hours preparation into that interview. The, the one um, great advantage that I had over you through that 18-year period was that I got time to prepare interviews. And I really admire radio interviews who have interviews thrust upon them sometimes, yep. you know, with moments. Somebody is suddenly on the line yep. that you'd been chasing up and away you go. And... Um, are there some particular moments through, through your... Are there interviews that, that stick in your mind as real standouts? Total catastrophes. Catastrophes, yeah. <laughs> well, hang on, just before you go to the catastrophe, I do recall... You filled in for me once, didn't you? I did. Uh, it was How was that? Three of the toughest months of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it was hard work and, and you're just about exhausted and suddenly the conversation now begins. 
It's a perfectly good conversation hour in New South Wales. Take it. Um, but <laughs> but um, you, you interviewed Jeff Kennett once, and he revealed in that interview that I think when he was Premier, he was drinking 20 cups of coffee a day. Yep. Which actually explains a few things, doesn't it? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> a bit of caffeine overdose. Um, but those sorts of things are absolute pearls when they come along. They... they certainly are. And, I mean, you know, there's all the, the, the... You know, we could name drop forever. Between the two of us, we could have a jolly time here sitting, oh, what about so-and-so and so-and-so? And I pinch myself and I go, what was I doing sitting with Jane Fonda or Mel Brooks or Randy Newman or James Taylor or Jackson Brown? I could keep on going forever. And well, you... I get Tony Abbott and... <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Pine. <laughs> Anyway, keep name dropping. Yeah. <laughs> I got Tony Abbott too and he winked at me. <laughs> he did. <laughs> Could have done without that, but still. We, we replayed that shot out of context a dozen times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, but no, you, you do get those opportunities, but the ones that stand out are really, they're not the celebrities. They're the people who are just citizens who trust you to tell their story when they find themselves in an extraordinary situation. Uh, you know, the, the Nicole and Jackie, the daughters of uh, the woman who took her life through voluntary assisted dying, the, the first death. You get people who say, look, I have no idea how this works, but I'm going to trust you to make it a safe place for me. And, you know, I go right back to when I started. There was a, a woman called Sharon Gilhooley and um, her son had died in a car crash and she was extraordinary. She was so brave and so bold and she took that attitude that so many do which is that something terrible has happened to us and I really want to try and make sure it doesn't happen to another family and there have to be some changes to road rules and regulations and training and you know so on and so forth so other people don't suffer what we're suffering and go through the pain we're going through and those are the ones they're extraordinary and you know the the bushfires where do we start uh, unpacking that you know the the whole communal trauma but specifically the people who, you know, had their lives just destroyed in many instances and lost loved ones. Well, that has to be the hardest thing for a, you know, um, running a live program yeah. um, to, to deal with those sorts of moments. And, of course, the, the Jill Maher thing was the worst thing that ever happened in this yeah. building. And, and uh, you, you had to deal with that, um, having known her really well. And as the story developed, you would have known things that you couldn't share. And totally. Would have been in fact, we knew good. right from the start things we couldn't say and um, as a human, as a friend, as a colleague, you really wanted to say things mm. and yet all you would do by doing so would be to interfere with the administration of the law and the justice and the, the right someone has to a trial yep. and the last thing you would want to do would be to help him. So, you know, you just had to get through it. Mm. Uh, it's interesting, uh, time's passed, but the wounds are still there. But that team, those of us who are still at the radio station who were together then, there's this special understanding between us. Yep. Um, same with the bushfires. You know, we recently had an anniversary and there were people coming together and there were, there were colleagues here who were saying things out loud that they'd never said. Um, and, you know, that makes you realise, and you know, we're just reporting it, we're not living it, makes you realise the, the impact it has on the lives of those in those communities. It's a strange a thing time. because two of the most memorable uh, insiders programs um, that I headed up were, uh, had nothing to do with politics. Uh, the, the Black Saturday bushfires, well, happened on a Saturday, obviously, and um, the, the first footage came in from, our, uh, from the chopper and it arrived here in the studio uh, right on nine o'clock. We didn't have the ability to send them through and by then we'd already taken the decision. Julie Gillard, as Prime Minister at the time, was our guest, as it, as it just happened. <clears throat> so we got rid of the panel and we brought in the emergency services people, and so we had the Prime Minister sitting with them. And then we ran these pictures and none of us had seen them. And what you could see was just, as far as you could see, burnt out homes. Mm. And I think that's the first time that we properly appreciated. We knew it was bad. But to see that was utter devastation and you just suddenly you couldn't help but mentally trans translate that to a death toll, which is clearly... The other um, time that we threw the program out uh, was... Um, Just the... on that, Barry, yep. on that Saturday night, I don't think I've ever said this publicly, I was on air that whole afternoon and into the evening and we were getting calls from people and we knew they weren't going to survive, but what do you do? We were doing the best we could and it wasn't good enough and I'll, you know, mm -hmm. I'll 
carry that with me forever. But after I came off air and handed over, I don't even know how many hours I was there for, but eventually we found other people who could come and take over and keep the coverage going. But I then went and helped answer phones because it was all hands to the pump, it just was. And round about, I think, 11 o'clock, more people arrived and I was told, you need to get out of here and you need to come back in the morning, so I go home. Mm. And I got in the car, which had a parking ticket, <laughs> out the front, and I drove up past the gallery and as I drove across the bridge to Fed Square, there were people partying and they had no idea. And we already knew that a lot of people had died, although we weren't allowed to say so. And I had to pull over in Flinders Street and I wept. Mm. And then I went home, I hardly slept, came back and we had to keep going. Well, it was about five days before some relief people came from interstate. And it, yeah, that whole thing, you, you know, you must have done it too. You compartmentalise between what your professional duty and obligation is when you're, you're, you're in the studio, the red light's on, you're performing a role, you're playing a role and people are depending on you. And then eventually you wind down and it hits you what's been going on. Mm. And, yeah, you just... Well, the same impact happened to me but it happened live on air after the, the Bali bombing and in Paddy's Bar and that happened at about 1 o'clock in the morning our time on a Saturday night, overnight Sunday. Um, <clears throat> but it was back... Um, <clears throat> Well, the internet was only just getting going. There was no 24-hour news. And so the, when we got in at 5 o'clock or whatever, the news was just starting to drift in that there'd been this, this bombing and it was bad, but we had no idea how bad. And a woman phoned the Perth um, station and asked to speak to somebody because her son, a football coach, was in Bali and she needed some information. And they put, put her through to us and our executive producer spoke to her and that's how we made this contact. And we eventually spoke with the, uh, with the football coach and the feeling was that maybe 10 or 20 people had been killed. We couldn't really have any other uh, assessment of that because the police hadn't given any of that early stage. And he said in the interview, oh, no, no, there'd be at least 100, maybe more, have been killed here. He said, I've lost seven players from my own team. And he said, Australia better brace for this. He said, there could be at least 50 Australians dead. And there was 88 Australians in the end, I think. And this was and, live to air. Yeah, and he just sort of said... And that's the first time that we got a real appreciation of just how dreadful um, the So thing what's was. going through Barry Cassidy's mind while you're trying to think about all the logistics and the, you know, the sort of craft part of keeping a TV program going live to air? Yeah, you, you don't focus on anything other than what he's saying. Do you process uh, you're it You're absorbing all? it, yeah, you're processing it. And what you say next matters, of course, I mean, but... I remember saying to him, it was just a really, I don't know, I needed something to say, and I just said, football clubs are like family, mate. I know, I know what you, you know, I know what you're saying. But what, what did that mean, you know? But that's, that's the best I could offer up. It's, um, that, that was an extraordinary morning. That, um, but again, it, it, um, it had nothing to, do with, uh, nothing to do with politics because we were the only program on air and we had to deal with it. Hey, take me yeah. back to when you worked for Bob Hawke, and sadly, and Bob Hawke is and he recently departed. And um, mm. apropos of that, you've been away. Yes. Do you know Blanche has put a whole lot of his personal effects up for auction? Yes, I saw that. Um, You're going to bid for anything? No. I, um, I actually got up my fair share of some stuff at the, at the time. <laughs> um, you going to fess of, up now? Quite a bit of sporting memorabilia that, that, he, wasn't, <laughs> that he wasn't interested in. Um, I think she has said, hasn't she, that she consulted with the family and they've all had a go at it yeah. and, and this is the, what's left over after the scramble. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's OK. I mean, well, you could just send it down to the op shop. They can make $250,000 out of it. Look, can you... Um, is, is that it with, with Hawke or was there something else? <laughs> <laughs> because, um, you I, want to get out that lightly, no, do you? No, 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 no way. So, well, first of all, how was the wake? No, the wake was, was wonderful. I thought there were some really powerful speeches. No, not the public one. The private one. Oh, afterwards. Um, afterwards, maybe five or six hundred people crammed into a pub and down at um, um, or near King's Cross and, and it was just pandemonium. <laughs> Everybody telling stories and... Um, the most memorable of which... Very few of them truthful. <laughs> <laughs> like most. Uh, the most memorable of which... Uh, it, was, it was just a chance to see because you, you don't always... Um, 
get a chance to stay with the people you worked with, you know, all those years ago, and it was great to c catch up with so many of them. But the people that work with Hawke when I was there now, a lot of them are public figures still, and I think that was a, a key to his success. Really, he gave public servants um, their head to run the run the place, and and that's why there was a big focus on policy because the public servants, the, the chief of staff, are the public servant now. They're political operatives. Um, but, you know, people now like, like Rod Sims and uh, Sandy Holway around the Olympic Games and um, um, a, a whole bunch of them have uh, gone on and, and uh, Peter Harris, who runs the Productivity Commission, Dennis Richardson, who's probably one of the most senior public um, uh, ambassadors that Australia's ever had. They're the sort of people that were working in his office at the time and it was just great to catch up with, with all of those. I want to ask you, though, so that we can, can change the, um, the tone just a little... <laughs> Tell me an awkward moment, a really embarrassing moment, something that you, um, you know, that happened to you while you were on air. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. it, it would have been public at the time, so you know, <laughs> just reminisce, oh, remind look, us of it. Uh, oh, there's, you know, you get your your, your favourite moments. Uh, Geoffrey Archer, anybody here a Geoffrey Archer fan? Well, Lord Geoffrey Archer, the disgraced perjurer and prisoner, for people who don't know. He was a very influential conservative figure in, in politics and business in the UK. He was phenomenally wealthy. He also wrote these bodice ripper thrillers and he was publicly accused of having betrayed his marriage and had an affair. He sued for defamation. He won, collected even more money and later it was found that he completely perjured himself. He was then prosecuted for perjury and sent to prison. While he was in prison, he wrote a book, came out and did the book tour and came to Australia, we were offered an interview, and I went, you beauty, you bet. And he came in, sat down, and started talking about the book, and I said, I don't want to talk about the book, I want to talk about prison and being a perjurer. <laughs> and he said, no, 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 I'm not talking about that. And I said, well, I don't care if you don't want to. You're in my studio and you have to. And he went, no, 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 that's not what I'm here for. And I said, well, I don't care what you think you're here for. Answer my question. And he turned from the microphone looked out through the double glass at his publicist and said, why was I booked on this show? <laughs> it was a mistake. <laughs> and that all went to air. It was hilarious. Cool. So, yeah. The, the most awkward moment for me happened not on uh, Insiders but on News Breakfast because I actually, for, in, the, in the early stages, hosted it with uh, Virginia Trioli. And um, there was one morning when... And, uh, look, everybody was, you know, had their, their training wheels on. It was very early days. Uh, Virginia's reading the news at the screen and she got to the end of the bulletin and said, that's the latest news, Barry. Some guy in the meantime had come and sat next to me. And I look up at the auto queue and it had died. <laughs> and there was nothing there except this guy. Now, I don't know whether you saw that uh, moment at the BBC where the taxi driver just walked into a building and they grabbed him and shuffled him in and put him, <laughs> sat him down. They thought he was the guest and he was just sort of... And, and he sat there. That's what this guy was, would have felt like. Uh, so I think, what do I do? And I said to him, so, good morning. Um, so what's going on in your region? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, the stock market's died overnight. I said, ah, the finance guy. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was difficult. But the... You know, there's a famous, <laughs> famous uh, 3LO, as it used to be called, story of the, along those lines... Uh, Doug Ayton, some of you may well recall our drive presenter over many, many years, for about nine years, Doug Ayton. And same thing happened. Someone was wheeled into the studio and the computer screens died at exactly the same time. And he actually said live to where he said, who are you and what are you here for? <laughs> <laughs> I should have done that. Um, yeah, the, the, the other difficult moment was a, it was a Saturday night and in, uh, because in Melbourne we don't have the people to call on that you might have in Sydney and I had... It was seriously more than a man flu, it was. I had a really sore throat and a very bad headache. So bad. I said, I don't know whether I can do this. So I went and saw a mate of mine as a doctor and I just said, look, I've, um, I, I can't be replaced. Can you do, help me out? And he, he gave me something. He said, that's for the, if, when you wake in the morning, whatever your biggest problem is, if it's a headache, take this. So it was a panadine of water or something. And, and, uh, and if the throat is the problem, take this, but don't take both, right? <laughs> And I said, yeah, right. And uh, I woke up the next morning and they were both equally as bad. And <laughs> I took both and went into work. And at about seven o'clock, I just turned to Kate Tawney, who was the executive producer at the time. And I said, I can't stay awake. I just can't stay awake. And my head hit the desk. I woke up about 45 minutes later in the hands of paramedics. And I'd been out to it for 45 minutes. And in that time, the executive producer 
the first thing she did was ring Heather and, and, uh, and, and my daughter, who were actually in the country. It took them a couple of hours to come in. Um, she then rang Jim Middleton and organised a replace host. And then she got on with preparing the program. <laughs> Just leaving and, you there. Yeah, and, well, the, the paramedics were still treating me. And when I woke, I looked around, and once I'd sort of processed what was going on, I said, I'm feeling better. I think I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> And Kate Tawney said, no, you're not. <laughs> so I was a scratching that day. Is it true, Barry, that from time to time you've been live to air on national television and just a bit distracted? Between 9 and 10 o'clock? A sporting event, perhaps, on, a on Sunday the morning? side of the globe or a, a, a very, matter of great personal interest to you? Very rarely. Sometimes uh, those sporting events can interfere... Um, if they're being played internationally somewhere and, and it happens to hit our time slot, and that can be difficult. When I was doing um, offsiders as well, I mean, that was crazy because I had a responsibility to stay in touch with, <laughs> with everything. And Tell us the story of offsiders because, um, in fact, you and I are both yeah. equally the, um, uh, the parents of offsiders, yes, although we... your role is uh, somewhat more significant than mine. We are parents. John, for a long time, had his Christmas party in his backyard in Fitzroy. And uh, I was there on uh, um, one night just before Christmas and I was in a conversation around a barbecue with uh, Jared Waitley, Roy Masters, John Harms and Gideon Haig. And Tim Lane. And I'm listening to this conversation and I thought, there's a program in this. <laughs> <laughs> and because our studio was open, without giving away too many secrets, we had the, you, you open up a studio but you, you might spend three hours, you have the crew in for three hours when you pay them for four or whatever. And we thought, well, we can do this and it won't cost us any extra money. And so I put the idea up and we went ahead with it. Um, but, of course, I then had to host the thing and that was madness. It went on for quite a few years. But it meant that I would come in on a Sunday morning and, and because the politics has kind of settled, I focused almost entirely on the sport, which <laughs> develops overnight, obviously, and that's what you have. And so the producers at, uh, at Insiders uh, weren't at all happy about that arrangement <laughs> because they couldn't get me here for a moment. But... It did enable me to do exactly what you said. I stayed in touch with all the overseas sport. And, so uh, is that where you got the reputation for caring more about the sporting results than what was going on in the national capital? I think that's probably where it happened, John. <laughs> I, I don't think it was just me wandering off and watching sport when I should be focusing on the, pro the programme. So what are the, what are the chances uh, reincarnated uh, Barry Cassidy becomes a full-time sports analyst and reporter? No. I, I started out um, in sport um, in the country... Uh, I was a sports reporter and mainly covered Aussie rules in the bush. Um, but I then didn't get another crack at it, really, until... Uh, when, when the World Series cricket started, um, I was just a general reporter in the newsroom. For some reason, it was thrown to me to cover all of that. So that gave me something in the, in the, in the middle of my career. Um, but it was only when Offsider started that I got an opportunity, from re really, for the first time. Y you might remember, and I'll, I'll say this because this is in the context of how John Fain in particular, and by the way, let me just say that he's one of the most fearless, um, not only interviewers, but broadcasters that uh, Melbourne's ever had, that's, that's for certain. Um, he, he doesn't mind who he offends, um, <laughs> in, in the interest of the story. And, and you might remember, you went into that, as I did, and, and the rest of the, the ABC, when Sydney took away our sports segment in, in the Melbourne News, and we got this terrible package from Sydney every night. That are, you really going to tell this, are you going to tell this story? Well, no, the, the, the story that I was going to tell is we, we had a protest out the front and, uh, <laughs> and around the corner came all of these labour, the Brickies labourers and the building workers. Uh, and who was leading them? Do you remember who it was? No. It was the guy who ran the Grand Prix and, and, and the... Um, all those years. Um, oh, you're, like Ron Walker. Ron Walker. Yeah. Ron Walker led them and we couldn't believe it. Yeah, you're right. And, and anyway, Ron Walker turned up at this event and we lost that fight. Um, but we've, we've had a lot of other fights over them. But when, when Insider started, I insisted that it be done out of Melbourne. When I told them I was leaving, I wanted some sort of guarantee that it would continue to be broadcast out of Melbourne because we have... Melbourne has McAuliffe and... Um, and and The Weekly, and News Breakfast, of course, and... Tom Gleeson, Tom Gleeson, Back Road. So there, there are some programs, but the bulk of them come out of, out of Sydney, and it's just too easy for them to take a program away and move it up to Sydney because it's convenient to them. So we, we, do, uh, we do go into bat. But one thing that, that you've always had the courage to do as well is to take on ABC issues. And just in that context, um, 
I've got a question. It, it's more of a comment, but it comes from Lee Sales. <laughs> she said, thanks for the feedback. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you were prepared to call that out because you felt it was inappropriately dealt with. And, and so do I. I think the fact that, that the, the interview was done um, in his restaurant gave him some advantage and um, some control over it um, in, in sort of a visual sense. Uh, so, but I remember when Michelle Guthrie was sort of um, in those declining months that you had a real go at her while she was still managing director. Yep. On several occasions, including once at a lunch at the press club where she was speaking and then she tried to avoid taking questions afterwards. And, I, yeah, I was prepared to state publicly that I didn't think she was doing a good enough job and I wanted her to do a better job on behalf of the organisation. Um, I got a bit of career counselling about that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I might say I brushed it aside and said, well, I understand it's foolish in one way, maybe a little short-sighted in another. On the other hand, if it's ever a choice between being liked and being respected, I'd rather be respected. And if uh, the managing director of the ABC is effectively letting down the ABC, then it shouldn't be just people outside who say it, but we have to be capable of being just as, uh, just as tough on our own as we are on everybody else. And, yeah, from time to time I'm pretty tough on other people. I have to be just as tough on myself, and I hope I am, and just as tough on some people who I might then be standing next to in the queue at lunchtime. And, yeah, that can be a bit awkward, but I'd like to think, and, you know, I've, I've sent messages to Lee saying this, that we need to understand and distinguish. It's like with, you know, the police commissioner, it's the difference between personal and professional. It's about, hang on, this is our job. It's part of what we're required to do. It's not a personal criticism. It's about the direction of a program or it's about a, a particular approach to holding people to account. Mm. The best and worst managing director of the ABC has had. Let's start with the worst. Oh, Jonathan Shire Jonathan was even, Shire. Worse, even worse than Michelle Guthrie. Absolutely. <laughs> with with John, Jonathan Shire, I'll just give you a quick story about Jonathan Shire. Insiders started at a... Um, um, Max Utrich was the correspondent in, in, Washington, in London and he phoned me up, I was in Brussels, and he said uh, uh, that he'd just been appointed head of news and you've been banging on about a Sunday morning program so now's your chance. You know, I'd been talking to people about this idea I had for insiders. And so he then said, go ahead, put your head together with a few other people and come up with something. And we came up with a, with a, with a plan and, and they said, right, well, you're going to have to cut short your time in Brussels, go home. And I was home within three weeks, so I come home with the whole concept ready to go and... Uh, Max Utry said, look, this is a little difficult, just leave it with me, I'll deal with it. But Jonathan Shire has decided you're not hosting it. I said, well, hang on, it's my idea. He said, well, yes, but it's, you gave it to the ABC, so it's now for the ABC to decide who hosts it. He said, What's, who's hosting it? He said, Paul Kelly is hosting it. And I said, what, what happens to me? And he, and he said, well, when I put that to Jonathan Shire, he said, we'll find a role for Barry. <laughs> So I think he was the biggest clown that ever ran the organisation. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think Mark Scott was probably the outstanding managing director, and I do see a bit of Mark Scott in, in David Anderson as well. Um, but um, who is our, our current managing director? Yeah. But only new in the job. Yeah, but uh, I, I thought Mark Scott had your back the whole time. You, you felt yeah. that, and and he he got it. He understood what the organisation existed for, and David Anderson certainly is displaying that as well. I think Sammy's going to take over in a moment, but can, can I just ask you what you'll be doing this time next year? I have no <laughs> idea. Um, if I did know, I'd tell you. Uh, I don't have any plans, and I'm not going to do a, a, a Christopher Pine or a Julie Bishop and start kind of, you know, <laughs> lining things up while I'm still working for an organisation that requires absolute independence, impartiality, and... Uh, an avoidance of conflicts of interest. and not, I'm not passing judgment on them for a moment, no, far be it <laughs> for me, but uh, it, it would be wrong for me to use my position at the ABC to try and line up work for when I leave. Um, but I, I do have some simple criteria. I want to be useful, uh, stimulated and at least occasionally paid. <laughs> and uh, if I can find things to do that meet those criteria and I never see an alarm clock with a four on it again... Yeah, well... <laughs> then I'll be pretty happy. Uh, look, you know, I've got other things that happen in my life. I've got elderly parents and I want to be able to spend more time with them. I'd love to spend more time travelling with Jan. Uh, we have a two-and-a-half, nearly three-year-old granddaughter and they live in a very remote part of Australia in Arnhem Land. We wouldn't mind getting back up there a bit. So there's a shed full of projects waiting to be done. Uh, yeah, there's, you know, 
bit of grease under the fingernails still to come. So there's lots and lots of things that I'm looking forward to doing. But, yeah, staying engaged may well be part of it. Mm. I know I'm going to miss the place incredibly. Uh, you don't spend 30 years working in an organisation and 23 years just doing the same thing and walk away and not feel a little bit of a, a twinge about it. Mm. But that's, that's the decision I took. All that sounds great. Um, I, um, <laughs> all that I have locked in at this stage at uh, RMIT, for whatever reason, appointed me an adjunct professor. I'm, I'm a very academic type, by the way. I just, <laughs> I'll absolutely smash this. <laughs> Um, so, what does the adjunct bit actually mean? What it allows me... Well, it's honorary for a start. I think that's, um, that's a bit of a worry. But um, <laughs> it, what it does, it enables me to quite regularly um, talk to aspiring journalists and talk to them about the profession and also about the, the politics and, and how it works. And, um, so that's, that's something that I can, that I can do, I think, um, and I'll really enjoy. Um, but beyond that, I, I'm not giving it away. I, I, I'm, I've got an idea. For, but it's only an idea. For a program? Yeah. It, it won't be a program that pins me down in the way that Insiders did, so that I'm locked in every weekend for the whole year. Um, and so it, it, it would be more occasional. But I, I don't want to really go into any detail because um, I might fall flat on my face. And <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I've, um, put a, I've put a proposal to ABC management as well. I've said that I think what we urgently need is a... 20-part series about car and automotive museums of the world. <laughs> Whatever happened it to that car much museum that you yeah, campaigned yeah. for for so long? Yeah, we're still working on that, don't yeah. we? <laughs> it's on the back burn. <laughs> hey, look, Sammy Jay's Sammy. loitering with intent. <laughs> Can I just start by saying a round of applause for John Fain and Barry Cassidy? Thank you. Thank you. There are no notes. They have no auto cues. <laughs> That was an hour of just finely balanced discussion, unrehearsed. Uh, my hat goes off to you, or it would if I were wearing one. Um, but right now it is time to hand it over to the floor. I think Michelle Guthrie has the first question. <laughs> <laughs> no? Not there? OK. Was that a hand? This is time for hands and I will sprint towards you. Oh, good on you. OK, right at the back. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my friend. What is your name? My name is Peter. Now, Peter, if you're asking John a question, do not ask him how he is first. He hates that. It holds it up on the radio program, OK? <laughs> Firstly, I just want to say thank you to both of you for everything you've done. Um, I found your description of world politics even more depressing than I had anticipated. <laughs> and I would like each of you to tell me one positive thing that we can look forward to in the next five years. <laughs> <laughs> What a question. OK, I'm, I'm, cool. I'm happy to go first because Barry's looking a bit stuck for words. <laughs> um, I actually expect there to be a reaction. You know, I, I wasn't great at physics, but for every reaction... What is it? For every force, there's an opposite reaction. So I actually think we saw this after Hillary Clinton lost the election. The level of engagement in the United States soared. And likewise, the same thing's happening in the UK... And I would like to think that the reaction to some of the chaos is people say, actually, you know what, it's up to us. So I don't see, I don't see Trump as... Uh, he, he's not the disease, he's a symptom. The reason you've got him is what you've got to inquire into. And the reason you've got him, I think, is because people have disconnected and they've let the whole thing go on remote control. And we have to get back control. People have to actually get out of their, uh, their comfort zone and realise that uh, if you don't maintain this piece of machinery, it'll seize up. This notion, though, that people are disconnected, and I get that to an extent, but we can't either airbrush the fact that a lot of people are racist and they're bigots, and they only need that kind of a nod from the senior position to come out in all of their glory, and that's what happens. Why are they now... The, the, the Ku Klux Klan almost disappeared in the 90s. Now there are 25,000 of them in the United States and why they suddenly feel emboldened. Look, you talk about positives, and you know, I hope there are positives, but if you look at climate change, is, is there any, any prospect of a, of, a, of a more awakened attitude towards climate change around the globe in the next five years? Probably not, so you can't look there. Um, you look at the asylum seekers who are sitting on Manus Island and Nauru, are they likely to be there in five years' time? I tell you what, every prospect. So I wouldn't look there for, uh, for anything particularly... Uh, 
Barry, positive. The mood down. Can you think of <laughs> one positive, please? OK, we, we haven't had a Prime Minister sack between elections now for quite a long time. <laughs> and I don't think that'll happen. Um, but, you know, even there, you consider... <laughs> We say we don't like this notion of sacking Prime Minister between elections. Julia Gillard took over and Kevin Rudd got re-elected, albeit in a minority government, but she got re-elected. Malcolm Turnbull took over from Tony Abbott and got elected. Only just, but he got elected. Scott Morrison took over from Malcolm Turnbull and got elected. So, you know, if you don't like it, vote against it. <laughs> but people are not. But at least I think there will be, whether you like it or not, there's going to be, um, or whether you like the direction of politics in Australia or whatever... I think we're about to have a far more stable period than what we've had for the last 10 years. Well, that's positive-esque. So <laughs> let's take another question, my friend. I've spent a bit of time listening to you both, and John particularly is never able to give an opinion of his own because it's an ABC um, policy, I'm sure. Um, so now you're going away from the ABC. Is it likely that either of you two gentlemen will now become actively involved in politics yourselves in some way and take an interest in policy from your own perspective? I certainly won't get involved in politics. Um, I was given that opportunity many, many years ago and my response was that there's really only one seat in the country that I would want to represent and that was the one where I grew up and have some kind of attachment to, Indi, and that already embraced the idea of independence and <laughs> I'd miss the boat anyway but uh, not at the time when I was ma made the offer it was a very safe coalition seat but um, hang on this is I've never heard this before <laughs> were you offered pre-selection not in Indi though you see that no, was my where? point I was I was offered a seat um, north of Canberra um, and Goulburn was the centre of it at the time and I said well look all I know about Goulburn is that I've taken a couple of slow horses there <laughs> For races, I don't think I'm the right person. But that didn't matter to them, you know. That's not the way it works. They so just wanted a candidate. Who were they? And the Labor Party. This is when I was yeah. working for Bob Hawke. At the time when you were a press secretary? Yes, and I'd never been a member of the Labor Party, by the way. Never have been. Um, but that, that seemed to escape them. But because I worked for Bob Hawke, <laughs> they felt that I was a, a likely candidate. But, um, no, I, I, I didn't do it. And, and I did say to them that, um, um, that Indi would be the only seat I would ever have uh, contemplated... Uh, representing, but as as for more broadly on, on what you say, without going into politics, I, I can see me sort of getting more involved in, in the public debate uh, over some issues um, once I'm, I'm free of all the uh, the restrictions that the ABC obviously naturally plays on me. Well, were you to stand, Barry, and then win, and then have to stand again, I think back to you, Barry, would be a great slogan. <laughs> <laughs> It wouldn't have meant much 30 years ago, but... <laughs> uh, John, to follow up uh, yourself... You got uh, look, I, I find the cut and thrust and the intrigue and the numbers games and the strategies absolutely addictive, and if there's the prospect of an attempt to seize and grasp power in the Citroen Car Club, then uh, <laughs> I can well see that I may well achieve elected office of the highest status there. No, um, the idea of betraying everything you've said for the last... 30 or so years of your professional life uh, in some sort of vanity project uh, strikes me as being ridiculous, quite frankly. Uh, I said before I want to be useful, stimulated. Um, I'm not sure how useful most politicians actually are. Uh, I, I have been on air with multiple premiers over the years and have received text messages on my phone while the premier is being interviewed from backbenchers saying... I can't get an answer to this, can you ask? <laughs> and a question. Mm. And most members of Parliament are incredibly frustrated at how little influence and how little power they've actually got. I'm interested in the machine and I'm interested in making the machine work for you, for us. And if there's something I can do that helps uh, to lubricate the machinery, I'm very happy to do that. But that's not partisan. It's about democracy as a, as a piece of equipment. Gentlemen, uh, I'm going to end, if I may, sincerely. I turned 18 in 2001, my first chance to vote, watching Barry's new show at the time. Went to uni listening to John Fain. It's an absolute thrill and an honour to share the stage with two of Melbourne's most prominent broadcasters. Oh, thank you. Of the past. I understand. Thanks, Matt.
Thank you. You've been an amazing audience. Thank you for coming along, ABC. See you again shortly. Thank you. Thank you.